What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Bootleg Football Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Coleman, here with my wonderful co-host, EJ Snyder. And we're uh, we're back to doing the normal show. We're back to uh, no longer being on the season preview kick. Uh, it, it's It was a, a wonderful two weeks, quote-unquote, off for us, even though our last episode <laughs> just went live on Friday. But uh, we, we got two weeks off from recording, but we're back. We've seen some preseason games. We've seen virtually all of training camp at this point. And we're doing a little bit of a, a young quarterback status update today. These are not just quarterbacks from this draft class, but one from last draft class, uh, especially now that we've seen them a little bit in the preseason, some more than others, obviously. And uh, we're trying to get a, a good read, not just on where they're at right now, but where they might be for the rest of the season going forward. But before we get to all that, EJ, buddy, how you doing? What are you drinking? Uh, not tonight, today, as we record this. Indeed, we are recording this on a Sunday, so not all the preseason games have rolled off for the weekend. But I'm good. A uh, little sleep does a guy wonders. Uh, so starting to train for the regular season. Got Fremont Lush here, one of my favorite in-season beers. Um, and happy to talk about quarterbacks both you know second year guys and and true first year guys and what we can tell from Ooh, those was a great limited amounts sound. that was a really good cork <laughs> sound it's like foley cork sound it's amazing so we get to take a look at all these guys some of the situations have changed changed pretty drastically justin fields and trevor lawrence for for two in particular but you know getting our first looks at the rookies and some of them again have played more some of them have played almost none at all at least in the preseason games uh but we've seen some of the highlights for them in practice and we we know a little bit less about them it's more sort of taste and flavor for them because we have very little actual stuff to look at uh with the second year players i feel like probably going to get a much better handle on all of them by the end of this season but even through this second round of preseason games a little bit more to deal with so it feels like a good time to sort of take the pulse see where we're at uh make some eh, maybe a little bit early predictions for them not so much for the rookies and and go from there well as you mentioned we're kind of structuring it the top five quarterbacks from last year's draft and then the top five from this year's draft and then a little bit of a bonus for uh for good old davis mills who yeah. was drafted outside the top five last year but definitely played like a top five quarterback in that class so i guess technically we're doing 11 quarterbacks today but we're going to start off with the 2021 quarterbacks of course with mac jones we're doing this in no particular order, but also kind of a loose order in terms of who had the most successful rookie seasons-ish by various metrics. Mac Jones, by most metrics, had the most successful rookie season out of all of the 2021 quarterbacks last year. He was efficient. He was accurate. Displayed some really good pocket movement. Um, displayed, in my opinion... A better mastery, actually mastery is too strong a word, better competence within a notoriously hard to learn offense, that being Josh McDaniel's specific version of the Earhart Perkins systems that New England's run for decades at this point. It's hard for a rookie to come into that with how meaty and dense that offense is and be able to run it from day one. And he pretty much did like there was a little bit of a competition to get him on the field at first but once once he got on the field he looked good pretty much from the word go there was a couple games in there every now and then where it was a little bit shaky you know some rookie growing pains here and there but for the most part again took care of the ball was accurate good in the pocket um, I have I, I at least had almost zero complaints with Mac Jones as a rookie going into year two I do have a little bit more trepidation and I, I this one's going to be a lot different than the others because the trepidation isn't necessarily with Mac Jones it's with what's around Mac Jones the loss of Josh McDaniels to go be the head coach of the Raiders I think it's it's not being talked about enough and in particular we're not being we're not talking enough about who's replacing Josh McDaniels which is this weird committee between Joe Judge and Matt Patricia, you know, two guys who, quite frankly, have nowhere near the experience coaching offense and calling plays that Josh McDaniels does. 
like even just as offensive position coaches, they do not have a whole lot of experience and they're being trusted to not just run again, notoriously complicated offense, but also develop Mac Jones and, and help him take a year two leap. We have seen so many reports throughout Patriots training camp and even you know seen a little bit in the preseason where it's like bad day for the Pats offense, bad day for the Pats offense, bad day for the Pats offense. There's only so many days in a row you can do that of saying like, oh, well, maybe the Patriots defense is just good. You can only do that for so long before you're like, maybe the Pats offense is legitimately terrible. And I don't necessarily think it's Mac Jones's fault. I think the coaches that are being tasked with guiding him and developing him are just quite frankly not up to the task. And I'm legitimately worried here. There's a lot of talent in New England. We went through it in the offseason preview. They have some really good players, especially on offense. But the guys running the ship, I don't trust. And for that reason, I'm not out on Mac Jones, but I'm definitely worried about Mac Jones. My feeling mirrors yours. He's very good in his first year, especially good early. Usually we see rookie signal callers come on late, right? They struggle through the first bunch of starts. And even if they pick it up very quickly, they start to trend upwards towards the end of the year. Mac Jones was a little bit different. Came out of the gate really hot and efficient. And through the middle, well, first part of the season, once he took the starting job over, and and certainly through the middle third, looked really strong. And then just the length of the season and defensive coordinators catching up a little bit seemed to seemed to sort of even it out and he flattened out towards the end of the season he wasn't he struggled a little bit more to create opportunities in the back half of the season which was a little bit backwards but overall as a rookie in a very complex system he played very very well he played in command he was efficient he showed enough arm and better than average mobility and this is the table i pounded you'll remember through that entire draft mm-hmm. cycle he's not a terrible athlete he's not a terrible athlete everybody's like whoa he can't play outside the pocket. I was like, no, he didn't play outside the pocket a lot at Alabama, but he's not a terrible athlete. If he's asked to do it, he can get it done. He has functional athleticism. So this is the big banging on the table. Told you so. Looked fine doing that uh, in his rookie season. Year two, I think he's going to be very much the same quarterback, but might not have as good a results. And that's a strange thing. He's going to play very well. I think he's still going to be very good this year. He was very good last year but might not be a lot better. And that's what people expect in year two. We expect to see that jump, that acceleration, that. And he will have some of that, but I think the play calling worries, woes, whatever you want to talk about, offset that to a significant degree. Josh Daniels is really good. There's a reason that he left New England, came back, and continued to have that team wired up in the playoffs and going to Super Bowls. He is a very good offensive coordinator. It's going to be a loss no matter who replaces him. And the who I'm concerned about, just like you are. It's not just anybody or um, this isn't the Brian Dayball to Ken Dorsey transition, which we're much less worried about. This is a, ooh, um, Josh McDaniels to whom exactly? We're not even sure. So I think Mac Jones is going to be steady, and that's good steady. That's, you know, good, solid, young quarterback steady. Not sure he's going to be as good or take that second year leap and again it's not his fault let's go to trey lance uh somebody who we did not see a whole lot of in his rookie year i think he started one game if i recall correctly maybe two uh in the absence of jimmy g but in the rest of the year he was a package player especially down in the red zone or in high leverage third down situations where they wanted to run the ball in short yardage and use trey lance's mobility to kind of augment the run game uh I, I think going into year two, A, I'm excited to actually see Trey Lance be the starter from day one, you know, have the job the entire offseason virtually, um, and and just be the guy. Because I think Trey Lance as the guy is going to be a lot different than Trey Lance, you know, coming off the bench for three snaps in one game. That being said, I did go to Niners camp a couple weeks ago now by the time this goes live. And I did watch him in practice, live, for that week. You know, saw the game, everything like that. And I do think that Niners fans need to be prepared for a roller coaster. Uh, The accuracy, and I I couldn't take video during team periods. I could only take video during, you know, basically the, I don't want to call them warm-up periods, but individual drills, you know, bag work, all that kind of stuff, throwing on air. And then once we actually got to situational drills and two-minute move the ball period, red zone, all that kind of stuff. I could be right on the sidelines, but I couldn't record. So I couldn't 
document the throws I'm referencing here. But I want you to know the ball did go wild. Not overwhelmingly often, but enough where I'm kind of like, okay, there's going to be some misses that are frustrating. Not just deep down the field, by the way. Like, he's aggressive and will take shots, and not all of them will hit. He, he might, I think he hit like 25% of his throws beyond 20 yards in practice, if I remember my notes correctly. But even just stuff, quick hitters over the middle. You know, balls were going behind receivers, you know, trying to throw a seven route to the pylon in red zone period against an inside leverage safety, which should be a pitch and catch for a touchdown. He sailed it wide. You're going to get that. It's going to bug the hell out of you. But at the same time, I also saw him make some plays in those practice periods where I was like, oh, shit, Jimmy couldn't do that. Like, he, his arm is real. His mobility is real. His explosive movement, both inside and outside the pocket, is real. You're going to have to get through some games that just bug the hell out of you in order to get to the promised land on the other side. But that being said, the highs are so high that I can't imagine Niners fans won't be excited by the end of the year. There's going to be some games you lose that you shouldn't. There's also going to be some games you win that you shouldn't because of what Trey Lance can do. It's very similar to Justin Fields where it's like, God, you're going to have to get through through some plays that just bug the shit out of you, but then Justin's going to take off for a 60-yard run and everything's going to be right with the world. Trey Lance is going to do the same thing. So I think Niners fans and Bears fans are in very similar positions right now where they're hopeful and they see the potential and we're hoping they get to the potential. And I think the odds of that happening are probably about 60-40, which is still better than I would give most young quarterbacks of reaching that potential. Rookie seasons for quarterbacks are tough. I don't care who the rookie is. I don't care what season it is. They are not good statistically, even if they are the best ever. They're not great. And this is, by all accounts, Trey Lance's rookie year. He had almost as many rushes as completions last year, 38-41. to So not a lot of opportunity, period, to be on the field. So he's got some of the speed, but this is also the most inexperienced quarterback in this class. He came out. He had less opportunity. Played basically one full year at North Dakota State, and that's it. So he's still learning, but those flashes, the flashes we've seen in the preseason, the flashes you saw in practice, they show you why San Francisco invested. Those are things Jimmy G dreams of doing some of those throws and that's all he can do on those things his dream of doing them so the fact that Trey Lance can and eventually will are why they push so hard to get him and why it's his job to lose now are you gonna have to put up with some stuff on the way yes this is essentially again his rookie season it's how quickly that turns to hey there's more good than bad because for a while, there's going to be more bad than good. And we need to see that balance move. Like I said, most rookie quarterbacks towards the end of their rookie season, you start to see that. You start to see it come together. The game slow down in a little bit and them to make more of those positive plus different sort of making plays more often. He's got a really good surrounding cast. He's got a, he's got a coach that understands quarterbacks and he has an excellent surrounding cast. Those are both really good things for a young quarterback's development. So the stage is set and now it's all about how quickly he turns these lessons into I'm not going to do that twice and starts making those sort of jaw-dropping plays with regularity. So if he does that, if he's able to quickly adapt this team pushes into the playoffs as a really dangerous out as a team you do not want to play they have a physical fast defense they've got playmakers on offense and if their quarterback is pulling the trigger in the right spots you're not going to want to play this team late in the season if he struggles throughout you know again maybe we see it next year i know that's not really fair his first year was i'm not going to say wasted i'm going to say spent very particularly by the 49ers so we knew that this would come eventually this rookie year is coming now, and we get to see how quickly it progresses. Uh, by the way, this is only a, a side note, um, but I saw it in practice, and we saw it in the game that week. Danny Gray is a rookie you guys need to pay attention to, which yeah. I know you're going to run your victory lap on Danny Gray, but there's something there. There's something there with Danny Gray. And when he's on the field with Ayuk and with Debo <laughs> and with Kittle and whew, speed, yeah. speed, legit fast and he's got good size and so it gives you that 
what he's going to play this this year, which is that real third wide receiver option that if you're playing a, a, a top cap defense, if you're if you're you know keeping a guy deeper than the deepest guy, he's going to pull that defense and stretch it in ways that you're not going to want um, really quickly and are going to have to adapt to. So even if they don't throw it to him, it's going to open up those underneath throwing lanes for a guy like Debo who can do a lot maybe the most in the league with underneath throwing lanes and then Ayuk who can be effective at all levels of the field it's just one more sort of piece to that surrounding cast they didn't necessarily need but they're more than happy to have uh Zach Wilson third 2021 20, quarterback I want to get to this one uh is is tough because he did hurt his meniscus in the first preseason game I think within the first like 10 snaps he was on the field you know, he just had a, a really weird, awkward plant, got a bone bruise and a, a torn or slightly torn meniscus, which I believe they had um, not a full repair. A full repair would have knocked him out for the year. Uh, what do you call it? Not a cleanup. Clean up. Where they kind of, yeah, it is. Where it's they like clip off the part. Yeah, trim. Yeah. yeah. So it's possible he plays week one, but even then he's, he's going to be in significant pain because I've hurt my meniscus before. And trust me, it sucks. It, it absolutely hurts, and especially bone bruises. Which I did not know you could get a bone bruise that way. Uh, bone bruises, also extremely painful. So regardless of if he's on the field or not, he's going to be in significant pain, and it might be a little ways into the season before he even comes close to feeling 100%, let alone if he gets hit somewhere else and, and is dealing with other injuries throughout the year. So I think this year is going to be a little bit hampered by that, but... That being said, leading up to the first preseason game, all we heard about in camp was Zach Wilson is starting to play in structure. He's staying within the pocket. He's actually operating with timing and rhythm and, you know, obviously working with uh, Elijah Moore and just absolutely killing everybody except for Sauce. There was so much hype coming out of camp about Zach Wilson. And I know there's a, a couple notable Jets beat writers that are, on his ass every single practice but the majority of the news was incredibly positive and based on the people that I've talked there that cover the team the the positivity was real I wish I got to see more of him in the preseason we might not get to see him again until a few weeks from now in week one at best I do still believe there is a chance for Zach Wilson to be the guy for the Jets I know that it was very up and down as a rookie very up and down for every crazy BYU ish play where he's escaping the pocket and throwing a gnarly off platform ball 50, 55 yards down the field and making all those plays. There was also, you know, a four interception game where he's throwing it to absolutely nobody. And you're like, what the hell's going on, Zach? I think his growing pains were just as bad as Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence. You know, I won't even talk about Trey Lance. But I do just still harbor that belief in me that with his arm strength and with his not amazing mobility, but it's definitely enough, I do think that in this Jets system that prioritizes getting quarterbacks in the move with bootlegs and prioritizes, you know, creating opportunities one on one deep down the field, somebody with his deep ball skill set should be extremely successful. The only question is, for all the other things, could he stay in structure, in rhythm, in the pocket for the quick game that complements that? We hope the answer is yes. It sounds like the answer was going to be yes before he got hurt. We might not know the true answer until roughly week eight or week nine when we actually get to see him on the field for ourselves. I'm planning on going out to New York for a Jets game this year, which should be illuminating. Uh, but also it's going to be winter in New York, so who knows? Maybe they're just going to run Brees Hall 40 times that game. I guess we'll find out. Regardless, I'm still a Zach Wilson believer. I still think there's a good chance he becomes the guy. And just like Trey Lance, I'll give it probably a 60-40 chance because of the talent and the coaching staff around him. He has everything around him now. That's an important point. He has as much offensive line as a young quarterback could hope for. He's got every weapon and, and then some. His I, I know a lot of young quarterbacks would look at his surrounding cast and go, yeah, give me that and let's see how I do. And they're not wrong. The Jets organization has added everything Wilson would, should need 
to do what they want him to do. We hear a lot of reports in preseason. There's a lot of glowing things. It is different when the regular season hits. He did have a long way to go based on last year's results. Last year's results were largely ugly. There were flashes for sure, but they weren't sustained. And you need to be able to sustain drives in this league. And he couldn't. He fell apart for every reason that rookie quarterbacks do. So he's starting from, I don't want to say ground zero, but he's starting from a pretty low platform or expectation base. Looked like he was certainly doing better operating within the pocket, within structure, which is the way you keep drives going in this league. He can do all the stuff outside the pocket. We knew that. He can do that spectacularly. He has to be able to do the more mundane stuff and has to be willing to, able to see it and willing to check it down if he needs to instead of going for a hero play or running around for four or five seconds and getting smeared for a 12-yard loss. That doesn't help either. So it looked like he was making progress there. They've added even more talent. It feels like a make-or-break year, and now we get a pause with an injury, and will he be 100% when he comes back? We don't know. He's going to be playing with some discomfort for sure. That's not great because if you're the Jets, you can't be super patient beyond this season. This season... There's no real reason to do anything else. If he can come back and be healthy, yes, he's a starter. Yes, you play him. Yes, you get as many looks at him in as many situations as you can because you kind of need to be sure after this season what you're doing. If he's not the guy, you got to make a different move. Windows are too short to say, ah, we'll give him one more year to figure it out. No, this is the year to figure it out. And this bump, this injury at the beginning is not great. In my view, it stacks the odds against him because, again, he doesn't have a a stellar rookie year. He doesn't have a Justin Herbert type rookie year to lean on and go, yeah, but you saw all that stuff and it's better. So when I come back, I'll be fine. He's not starting uh, with those chips in the bank, right? So. He needs every good rep he can get this season. And look, it's New York. There's a ton of pressure. You talked about the beat writers, the media there, uh, absolutely carnivorous. Every misstep is going to be just fed on. There's a lot riding on it. And, you know, that might be any starting quarterback position in the NFL. But this one's in New York, and he's got to do it, knee or not, that's a lot of pressure for a young player. So I think that ratchets up the degree of difficulty. Can he do it? Sure. Will he do it? Mm, not so sure. We'll see. Moving to Justin Fields, I also think that he has a ton of pressure on him because he also has to make that leap. Even though he's getting a little bit more leeway because, again, it's a new staff. Everybody knows the roster's bad. Everybody knows that 2023 is when they're going to start spending money. There's still a lot of pressure on him to show that he can elevate who is there. You know, what can you do with Byron Pringle and Darnell Mooney as your top two receivers? Or or, or maybe it'd be Equinemius. I don't know. Uh, no, I think for right now, they're projecting Pringle, Mooney, and Velas Jones as the top three. Which is still not great. No. And so it's on Justin to elevate that this year and show that he can at least make an average passing game out of a below average assortment of weapons. It's a different kind of pressure because Zach Wilson has to show that that he can play extremely well when surrounded by talent and elevate good talent into being great talent. Fields just has to elevate below average talent into being above average talent. So it's still pressure, but it's a different kind of pressure. But that being said, this new coaching staff and new front office didn't draft Justin Fields. They didn't. So it, it, as much as we loved him as a prospect, and I, I still am extremely high on him, they're not necessarily chained to him either. And so if he doesn't show that he can get the best out of Darnell Mooney, get the best out of Cole Komet, um, you know, protect the football, do a similar thing uh, that we want Zach Wilson to do, which is stay in a clean pocket. Fields, even in this preseason, still has had multiple reps where it's like, bro, pocket's clean, stay in there and rip it. He still has a little bit of that tendency to run early, just like Wilson. He has to show that he's improving and developing. And just like the others, I probably give him a 60-40 chance at this point, which is the best we can hope for under these circumstances. But if he doesn't show that he can elevate these guys and, to use my favorite term, make chicken salad out of chicken shit, this regime is not going to be as patient as you think because they're not the ones that drafted him. They're going to have a lot of money next year. They're going to be able to make the roster any sort of way they want to. And if they don't have a belief in Justin Fields, 
I'm not saying they won't, but if they don't, don't be surprised if he has a shorter leash than we think. Again, love him as a prospect. I think he's extraordinarily talented. Great dude, hard worker, all that kind of stuff. I would keep him. But this is a big year for him. It's not just, you know, we can be a bad offense and accept it. They have to at least be average. Because if you're not average in this league, guess what? You're going to get replaced. His big plays are different than Zach Wilson's big plays. They're basically big, long-developing, play-action shot plays. Those are those are Justin Fields' bag. When he's in his bag, he's doing five- and seven-step drops with play-action, and he's hitting 55 yards. And he wants to hit them all the time, and he can. He's got a great deep ball, great arm. The things that he needs to develop and show are not holding on to it for too long and having things collapse or putting himself in undue pressure. So I saw him play versus the Seahawks live um, end of last week. And there were a couple plays, especially early, first two or three plays where I wanted him to wait a tick. It's almost like he's over-indexing, like quarterbacks who are known as runners standing in the pocket and saying, no, I'm going to throw it because I want to be known as a thrower. He was like, no, I'm going to process this quick because I want to be known as a guy that's get." And he was almost, well, there was one play in particular uh, down in Seattle's red zone where he was too quick. They were running mm-hmm. two-level crosser against single high, and if he had waited, he had pressure coming, but if he had waited the half a tick, the tight end was clearing over the safety, and there was nothing in the corner. It was, it was wide open. If he just floated that ball up there and taken the hit, it's a touchdown. But instead, he was like, ah, nope, and he chucked it out, uh, which is exactly what Desai and Hurt wanted him to do. They were baiting him into a four-yard throw on, like, third and seven. They're like, throw it short and tackle. So they, they brought pressure. He saw it, and he was like, aha, I see it. Bam, and he threw the little four-yard sideline. They got nothing, and they were off. Well, they kicked the field goal. If he'd waited just that half take, and so I know that sounds contradictory, but it is all about finding no, the J- right. JT O'Sullivan did a video on the exact same note when he played against the Chiefs, and he's like, "Hey, it was a it was an option route, or no, it was, a, it was yeah choice route against inside leverage defender from a stack." And JT's note was like, "This ball's you know nine times out of ten, it's going to go to that choice route." Because you got the clear at the point of the stack and then a choice behind it where he's just reading leverage. It's there. Throw it. And, you know, the the receiver who I, at the point of the stack, who I think was Pringle, if I recall correctly, got jammed up a little bit. And Justin just immediately moved backside. And JT's like, you got to stick with it. I know you want to get it out quick. I know the protection's not great. You got to stick with it. And I think that's my main my main concern with Justin, which is, I have very few concerns. Very accurate passer, great arm, mobile, all that kind of stuff. He sometimes is he's moving way too fast for his own good, to your point, both in terms of process and coverages and also when he decides to just tuck and run. It's like if one's there and two's there and three's not there, sometimes he won't peek back to four. He just says, fuck it, I'm out, because I think that rusher's coming, which – I get it, especially after last year. I totally get why his internal clock is shorter than a lot of other quarterbacks. But he's got to hang in there, read it out, and pull the trigger within the structure of the offense. It's a very similar issue to Wilson. Yeah, it's all about finding – because he, like you said, he can do it all from a physical standpoint and from a mental standpoint. He can do it all. He sees it. He's very, very smart as a quarterback Mm -hmm. and physically – I'm not going to say unlimited because that's the Russell Wilson thing. He he has all the tools. It's about finding the right balance, and it's a pendulum right now. And last year it was too long, and he didn't have very long, and he got crushed a lot because the line was terrible, the scheme was worse. And so he got slayed, but he would hold the ball too long and get wasted. And so I am sure that the coaching points from the new staff have been, you can't do that can't do that you can't do that so he's like all right i'll show them and he's over indexed to get it out get it out get it out get it out make a decision be quick don't hold the ball too long that's what they're looking for and sometimes like the thing jt mentioned the thing i mentioned from the seahawks preseason game he is going to have to wait a tick so it's a really hard thing to do to say you can't just it's not one size fits all quarterbacking is not that way on this play got to be quick it's not going to develop on this play got to hold it you're a half a tick away from a big play and knowing when to pull that lever is what separates average quarterbacks in this league from great ones let's get to trevor lawrence who similarly uh was not put in a position to succeed 
like Justin Fields last year. The coaching staff, I, I, I use the term coaching staff loosely for some of them. I'm not even entirely sure they coached. Like the development was non-existent for Trevor Lawrence. It was not fair to him. No. Might have been one of the worst situations for a rookie quarterback ever. And I don't say that lightly, ever. Mm -hmm. But he emerged stronger, better, faster on the other side. They brought in an actual head coach um, with an actual fun functioning modern offense with Doug Peterson. And looking at Trevor Lawrence in the preseason so far, like I'm just going to throw out last year. Like I, I'm not even bothering with last year. Looking at Lawrence now, what he's putting on tape now, looks like Lawrence at Clemson. That looks like first overall pick, bona fide, franchise quarterback, and potentially a lot better than just, quote, a franchise quarterback. Hmm. His arm strength, top notch. Mobility. For a guy who's 6'6", like it doesn't make sense how fluid and quick he is, both inside and outside the pocket. The footwork is, imp is impeccable. I mean, there was a couple throws he made against the Steelers. Um they were running uh, cover three uh, with a weak side rotation, and the nickel kind of buzzed out to be a curl flat. And from the far hash, Trevor hit a hole shot against cover three that melted my brain. I'm like, no, you shouldn't be able to do that. There's like four other guys in the league that can just look at a nickel and know he's buzzing out and say, fuck you, I'm still hitting that spot. I'm going to put it three inches above your hand. It's Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, and Aaron Rodgers. That's it. That's the list. Trevor Lawrence made that throw. And that wasn't the only one. Like there there was one that he hit. Uh it looked like a it looked kind of like a, a progression off of mesh where you had the mesh instead of instead of the over the ball route, they then broke it out to kind of make it into like a a sail concept type. Um I, I saw Cincy run it last year. I have no idea what they call it, but it kind of looks like mesh, but it's not. It like breaks out instead of breaking in. And he hit that thing on time and on target and just threw a rope. And I'm like, oh, my God, he looks so different. He looks so back. That's the best word to describe it. He looks back like he never left. And so that just these first few preseason games that we've seen from the Jags and watching Trevor Lawrence work and seeing where he's at now compared to whatever they were doing last year has made me alter my expectations for the Jaguars a little bit this year. Do I think they're going to be a good team? No, the roster's not there yet. But Trevor Lawrence looks legit. And I, I would say out of all these young guys, I know we're given like 60, 40 chances to work. I'm going to go a little bit higher for him. I think there's like a 70 to 80% chance that this is real and that he's going to be the guy, which you would hope you spent a first overall pick on him. But I think Lawrence is back. He is in some ways he never left like again it's not particularly on him we talked about this at the top of the show with Mac Jones um, you know Mac got more help he was in the best situation of any of the rookie quarterbacks last year in terms of support and um, maybe not supporting surrounding cast but in terms of coaching support and structure the best structure of of any of the rookies in terms of a landing spot as you mentioned Lawrence was in the worst even though he was in the worst, there was like three acts to the Jaguars season last year. The first six weeks where everybody was kind of like, uh, you know, with a new coaching staff, you're typically feeling it out, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. He had scattered in amongst those ugly losses at least one play a week for the first six weeks that you were like, ooh, just like the throw you mentioned. Ooh, not very, guys, <laughs> not very many guys make that throw. That's a rookie making that throw. That's a really good throw. That's a really difficult throw. And he still made it. And then after six games, the whole thing went to shit. And he didn't have those throws anymore. It just looked like scrambled eggs. It was it was awful in every regard. And then they finally make the decision to jettison Urban prior to the end of the year. And there's a three or four week segment at the end of the year. There's about a week of sort of title wash where still nobody's sure what's going on. And then in the last three, four games, he starts making those throws again. Not all the time, not mm -hmm. always the right decision, whatever, but he, oh, oh, that looks like the beginning of the year when there was promise, <laughs> right, after the whole thing. So it was this, you know, the beginning, middle, and, and ending act, and now you wash that coaching staff out, you replace it with Doug Peterson and his staff, Trevor Lawrence has to be breathing a sigh of relief, knows he dodged a bullet, and is doing the same things, but it's just getting way more help. 
way more help from the structure, from the coaching, from development. Um, they've added some weapons. They added some O-line. Like, everything is better this year. And he's like, I'm still good. I'm still good. And I think he's going to remind everybody that he's still really, really good. One of the best prospects in a while for a reason. And he's going to win some games on his own this year. And that's really what you're looking for at the quarterback position is, is this guy a placeholder? You talk about truck or trailer or any other analogy, or is this a guy that in the fourth quarter is going to go, nope, I'm going to hit. And he is particularly impressive in the window you're talking about, 15 to 20 yards, numbers and out. Mm -hmm. Like He hits those throws, opposite hash, weird platform, guy in his face like he hits those throws that one you talked about was double covered he had to get it over the nickel and under the corner and hit the guy in the hands in the only window where he could get his feet down and out of bounds on a rope like that window for him he's good in a lot of ways his running ability wildly underrated but that little 15 to 20 right in the you know yard wide box on the sideline he hits those dimes all the time it's just like flipping cards into a hat for him he's just one after another and you know people are gonna people are gonna come away saying oh the jags might not be so great this year but that dude give give him what he needs that dude will take you there uh also best part about that throw was the matumbo finger wag that he gave to the nickel right after like yeah i saw you bud but you're not getting it i don't care <laughs> now moving from the 2021 quarterbacks we have a group of 2022 quarterbacks uh, some of which were massive rivals to trevor lawrence <laughs> back in college in the acc acc uh somehow putting out a lot of quarterback talent these days and not to be overlooked this year either we're gonna we're gonna see some more guys come out of the acc this year but we're gonna take a quick look at the rookies obviously we haven't seen near as much from any of these players so we're not gonna make broad sounding propositions about what we think they're going to be these are these are quick hitter impressions again no particular order we're going to start with sam howell in washington he's currently third on the depth chart but he's he too has thrown some nice deep balls outside the numbers those have been the eye popping or eye catching throws he's made for me uh so far in both camp and the preseason games i like his potential but He's in a difficult spot. You talked about Justin Fields and, and not being drafted by this regime. Well, Howell was drafted by this regime, but he was drafted way down the board. And that means everything in terms of most players, but especially quarterbacks. If you're a third, fourth, fifth, sixth round player, the staff has no interest in giving you extra opportunities or keeping you around if you don't show absolute exceptionalism. And that's going to be the bar for Howell to kind of meet or overcome and that's a tough thing to do we're not going to see Howell unless Carson Wentz's leg falls completely off and Taylor Heineke gets hurt <laughs> Taylor Heineke has shown that he can win games Ron Rivera loves his vets he's going to play Taylor Heineke uh, until the bitter end there might be a game or two at the end when all hope is lost and Sam Howell gets a chance and he is going to have to shine like crazy if he wants to stick around, which is kind of a bummer. It's not fair. If you're listening to this and saying that doesn't sound great, you're right. It's not a great way to do things, but it is a common way to do things in the NFL. So unless there are some massive injury issues, we're not likely going to see Howell in the driver's seat. He is going to have to do with every opportunity he gets the absolute most if he wants to stick and hang around. But I think there's something there. What have you seen from Howell? I mean, in a way, he looks very similar to to what he was at North Carolina, but in both the 2020 and 2021 seasons, where, you know, 2021, they were not as vertical. It was a lot more quick game. Um, they featured his legs a lot more. Not that Washington's featured Howell's legs, but you can still kind of see, um, you know, the quick feet, the fluid hips, how he kind of maneuvers in the pocket. And you're like, okay, yeah, that athleticism definitely translates to him in terms of moving within the pocket. I do want to see if they kind of get him more involved in the run game uh, in the last week of preseason. And maybe if we ever see him in the regular season, sure. But I, I do think that athletically, the jump from good college athlete to good NFL athlete was still kind to him. I, I still think he is a plus athlete, even in the NFL. That being said, we've seen him, you know, show off the verticality a little bit more, 
both in training camp when we're just looking at camp highlights and some of the throws he made deep down the sideline. We're like, okay, that looks a lot more like 2020 Howell, not just 2021 Howell. And then in the preseason, we're seeing all the same, like, you know, real quick, snappy release, decisive, get it out quick, accurate, especially outside the numbers. I think that there is a possibility. <laughs> There's a lot of caveats there. I know <laughs> really tempering expectations. There's a possibility Washington has something here. Uh, you and I are not the biggest Carson Wentz fans. Um, you know, Taylor Heineke's fun, but he's still likely a backup. I think at some point, Howell has impressed me enough in terms of what we're seeing from camp and what we've seen so far in the preseason. Howell has impressed me enough where I'm I'm not convinced he's not starting at least a couple games this year because I think he has been better than what you would think for a day three quarterback prospect. So I think he's going to get on the field at some point eventually. I don't know exactly when. But somebody who's that accurate, that decisive, and who at least in the past and a little bit this summer showed that there's a vertical element to his game as well. He's not just a quote-unquote dink and dunk guy. A quarterback like that, I think, deserves a chance to at least show what he can do on the field. If Heineke got his chance, Howell should get his chance at some point, too. I agree, and I've been a little surprised by the fact that his connection with Deami Brown, his receiver from UNC who came out a year earlier than he did, who's also in Washington, hasn't really looked super dialed. I was surprised by that. I was imagining that those two would start clicking again and creating some of that 2020 magic. Um, little fantasy aside note, and I don't mean fantasy football, I mean just like fantasy notion. If I could pluck Howell out of – his current situation dangle him around and drop him into another spot in the league let me see how this hits you back up to russell wilson and hackett's offense in denver Ooh, okay that's perfect <laughs> because we know uh -huh. again what he can do is a vertical thrower with Cortland. Outside. and then whenever tim patrick gets back next year like he is so perfect for tim patrick as well and I think that he's pretty good in terms of working the the quick, you know, over the middle passing game, which Russ doesn't historically do. Howell does do that a lot. So, yeah, I'd be all for that. But I just at this point, I don't think Washington's letting Howell go until they see no, what no. he can do. No, nah, this is again. That's why I, that I presaged it with complete fantasy. Just be able to pick a guy and drop him into another ideal spot. Now, I don't see it happening anytime soon. They're certainly not cutting him this year. They need him. They know that Wentz uh, hasn't played every game for a while and that Heineke is a known. He can win. He's a gamer. Uh, he has, I think, more talent than maybe the average backup. Uh, but in terms of long term, is he a starter? I don't think he's crested that wave yet. And Howell we don't know yet, so we'll, we'll continue to take a look. But let's move on to one of the more exciting stories of this preseason for sure, and it's Kenny Pickett in Pittsburgh. He's leveraged his greatest strength. Coming into this draft, his greatest strength was experience. He had more downs, more throws, more looks, everything more than any other quarterback. In six years at Pitt, he, he had a lot of reps, and he's leveraged that experience and opened, I think, a lot of eyes because everybody said, well, because of that, he's already his ceiling. He's not going to be anything more than he is. A little bit kind of like what we were just talking about with Taylor Heineke. Um, he looks calm and efficient, which is not surprising, again, as an experienced quarterback. But you're glad to see that. If you didn't see that, you'd be like, well, what's all the experience for then? <laughs> he has looked every bit that, even leading a nice two-minute drive, um, not looking at all flustered, which is what you'd hope for. But it's a very strong sign. The thing that excites me the most, because one of the things in going back and studying Kenny Pickett and all those throws, was his accuracy, especially on crossing route stuff was not great he hung his guys out to dry at pittsburgh a lot even last year he threw some hospital balls and just kind of went deal with it and <laughs> that's not the kind of thing in the nfl that's going to endear you to a receiving core especially one as good as pittsburgh's you haven't seen that i haven't seen that so far in these preseason games his accuracy especially on those type of routes looks much improved is it perfect no is it better than it was in any of his time at Pitt, it is. He's hitting a much smaller window and putting guys in a position to succeed 
yards after the catch, run after the catch. So that's a really good thing. And he's got a lot of momentum there. There are a lot of Kenny Pickett backers. Again, hometown hero going from Pittsburgh to Pittsburgh. If a vet starts in front of him, if they start Trubisky because they want to start a vet who's looked okay as well. <laughs> ain't going to last long, I can tell you that much. <laughs> he's going to get the shortest rope ever, fair or not. Like the call for Pickett with as good as he's looked in the preseason is going to be loud and it's going to be early. And I don't know. I'm not so sure that that's not a pretty good thing. Now, if you'd asked me that right after the draft, I would have said, uh, you know, yeah, you get a better look at him, which is one of the things we were worried about having brought in a veteran in Pittsburgh and then drafted a quarterback. How much are you really going to know about Pickett after the season if he doesn't play a lot? Then you get to next year and you still really don't know if you have anything I don't think that's the scenario anymore. I think something happens, picket plays early, and the Steelers will know. And if early returns are to be believed, it is the preseason, he's going to play pretty darn well. You know, I think the – because I, I went back and I, I charted every single snap that he's taken so far because we didn't get to see him a whole lot in preseason week two. Maybe we'll get to see him more in preseason week three. But I, I went back and charted, especially all of his throws in the first game where we got to see a lot more of them. And the thing that I really noticed, my main note that was shared across all of the plays were on time. The rhythm was on time. Everything was in structure. It was like the anti Zach Wilson. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to get the same out of structure, crazy ass throws like you get from Wilson and Fields and... Uh, you know, to a degree, Lawrence and Lance, but they, they're they a little bit different. But in terms of all of the, oh, my God, that's not how we drew it up, but it still worked out type stuff, that's not Kenny Pickett. But Kenny Pickett is also extremely in command. He's seen a lot of football. He's played a lot of snaps at the collegiate level. He's an older prospect, but that's not a bad thing, especially for a quarterback like the experience really shines through. And I never once saw him look panicked. Like, even under pressure, never looked panicked. Eyes were always up and down the field. If nothing was there, yeah, he would run. But he wasn't just running from clean pockets. He was running because somebody was about to take his head off. So I think in control and on time and being in rhythm are the the main characteristics that we've seen from him so far. And they're not asking him to, to do a whole lot as a passer. They're not asking him to make you know, a whole shot from the far hash like Lawrence just made, because quite frankly, I don't know if he can. But in terms of everything else, like they're working the RPO game, they're working the quick game. Uh, There was a a slot fade that was a beautiful ball that he pushed down the field. And it was like his only downfield pass in the first preseason game. It was extremely well placed. Um, But I, oh God, I can't remember who the receiver was that just completely misjudged it and didn't turn to get it back shoulder. Uh, Might have been Calvin Austin, if I recall correctly. But regardless, it was a great ball. Receiver just didn't finish the play. But he never once made a bad decision, you know, left the pocket early, felt like there was a couple times where maybe he hitched a little bit. But again, we are nitpicking. I thought he was very in command of this team. And for a guy playing in, you know, his first two games ever as a pro, if you just look in command and look like you belong... You're good. You're fine. I, I'm totally okay with where he's at progression-wise. I think Kenny Pickett is going to start this year, and I think the number of games before that happens is maybe less than what it was three weeks ago. 100% agree on both of those points. I think the limitation for those wondering, well, were you wrong about Pickett? No, I think the limitation is the same. When defensive coordinators start to get tape on what he likes to do, They take it away, they take Mm -hmm. away the second, and they really put the game on his shoulders, right? They say, we're going to bottle up Najee best we can. That line hasn't looked amazing, so that might not be as hard as some people think, especially early in the season. And when they start to take away that on-time, underneath, bump-and-check sort of game and say, hey, we're going to leave that window, the one that Lawrence hits all the time, that 15 to 20 yards down in the corner or late-breaking window, we're going to leave that open for you. Can you hit it? Can you hit it under pressure? Like, that's when the cracks might start to show if they start to show. The the in-rhythm, the underneath, the on-time, the in-structure, he's, 
you're not going to rattle him. That That's all going to look good. It's when defensive coordinators start to turn the screws a little bit, not even necessarily get exotic because he's seen not all of that, but a lot of that. It's when they take away one, two, and maybe a little bit of three, and they say, okay, four down in the corner is what we're going to give you. Can you hit it? Then, then we'll start to see what Kenny Pickett can do. Matt Corral in Carolina, this one's going to be a little bit shorter, unfortunately. Done for the year with a Liz Franck injury in his foot. I I struggle. I'm certainly a Matt Corral believer and a Matt Corral backer. I was not wild about his landing spot in Carolina. I really didn't think Matt Rule and staff were going to use him correctly or give him what I considered sort of a fair shake. Certainly not after Mayfield came in. Mayfield is the was the presumptive starter, now has been named the starter. I don't think that's a bad thing either. This is not anti-Baker Mayfield. This is, eh, that's not, doesn't give Matt Corral much run. Add that to the injury to a guy who is more slightly built, who had injury concerns coming in because he will sell out and did sell out often in college and took injuries because of it. It's not a great start for a rookie. Not great landing spot going to miss his entire rookie season with an injury injury was a knock coming into the draft all this is adding up was not a high round draft pick it's all these things we've mentioned they start to add into the pot to make it more difficult for matt corral to have a breakthrough in carolina or elsewhere if he doesn't stick there um you know this year obviously on injured reserve we're not going to get to write anything more about this season for him um but overall, it casts a bit of a shade or a bit of a shadow over his start in the league. He is he was fighting a little bit of an uphill battle. He got drafted in Carolina. The hill got a little bit steeper. He got injured. The hill got even steeper still. So very talented player might need a fresh start somewhere else or under a new staff. And he's going to have to wait till next year to do that at the very earliest. Well, who knows? The new staff might actually be in Carolina this time next year. So that's correct. We'll see. We'll see. So moving on to Malik Willis in Tennessee. Uh, Malik Willis, one of the most talented prospects, but also one of the rawest in terms of an NFL passing game. Not as a football player necessarily, but making the jump from Liberty to the NFL in terms of what he was asked to do in the passing game. Everybody knew it was going to be a large step to climb, and nobody expected it to happen right away. That being said, he's shown some really good moments in camp in the preseason, More of them have been in the running game because he is an amazingly talented runner. Now, before anybody jumps into the comments and says you're calling him running quarterback, I am not. Malik Willis is an extremely talented thrower of the football. I'll say that again. Malik Willis is an extremely talented thrower of the football. He will eventually be a top-tier passer in the NFL if he continues to develop. That being said, the plays he's making right now, He is so talented with the ball in his hands. He's not just a good running quarterback. He is a threat with the ball in his hands at a level that we haven't seen in a bit. And so obviously more of those are the highlights that we've seen. Passing game was always going to take a little bit longer, and he doesn't have to produce. He is not expected to be the starter or the presumptive late season starter or anything else. Ideally, he won't be on the field this year in games that count, and then he'll get that time to develop. One of the things that I'm not surprised by but very happy to see is his teammates clearly love him there's a clip that came out a couple weeks ago from camp where they were doing one-on-ones and it was him versus jeffrey simmons (laughs) i saw that (laughs) and they had their backs to each other and deal is you give the ball to the offensive player they turn around and you know do whatever they can and malik basically laid down and rolled to him like a dog now if you do that wrong and you're a rookie that's going to cost you respect in an NFL camp if you do it right and you already have the respect of your teammates they're going to think it's hilarious and explode (laughs) in laughter and they all did everybody including Simmons thought it was hilarious as a show of deference to a very talented player from a rookie and it's so touchy I don't think people understand like how delicate that moment is to do it right or have it go terribly wrong and it was so right the entire team including coaching staff bought in he is clearly well loved in that organization and that's a big deal for everything we're talking about in terms of the development of a rookie quarterback it's going to be fascinating to track his progress it's doubtful we'll see a lot of that in meaningful games this year and that's okay and i mean in terms of how he looked on the field he looked exactly like malik willis at liberty so far where 
there's going to be some times where you know a rusher's coming in and he spins out of it and he's running free and making a crazy off-platform throw and you're like how the hell did he even do that and then there's some times where he's sticking in the pocket and you're like digs there malik get the it dig is there malik the dig is there malik oh my god throw the dig and and he doesn't you know so there's frustration but there's also excitement lucky for titans fans he doesn't have to play this year he's sitting behind Tannehill. he's on the bench he's he's learning and sitting and watching and doing everything that he should do and he's a great kid whip smart um, you know, unfortunately didn't get to play with a whole lot of great talent around him at Liberty. So he developed some bad habits, but being on the bench behind, uh, you know, a great pro like Ryan Tannehill, who's been and been around everywhere and seen everything and done everything. Learning behind him is the best thing that's ever happened to Malik Willis. One of the best things that I think has happened to the Titans in a while is getting a talent like him, uh, on day two that can be molded. And I think that pick, which we said it at the time is not for 2022 it's for 2023 2024 and beyond so what we hope for is that this turns into it's not going to be a pat mahomes situation because nobody's pat mahomes but if it can be like 70 percent of pat mahomes where he comes in after sitting for a year and he just looks good as a starter in 2023 i'm all for that and i think that because of his talent level and just who he is as a person there's a pretty decent chance that happens he's in a great situation and i'm rooting for him i think that's a, a solid assessment it's pretty much stayed the same which feels pretty good from our pre-draft evaluations our post-draft evaluations to our post-camp evaluations are yep he's on path right he landed in a spot where they were willing to let him do that they drafted him for quote unquote the right reasons or in the right situation and he's going to get that chance which is what we all want to see because there's so much there um super smart easily you know well-liked kid easily relatable so so talented we just want to see that maximized and he'll have that chance in tennessee on to desmond ritter in atlanta not much film on Ritter yet in live action. Basically, a game. The second game's going to go off today. We'll know a little bit more. And he's been okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's it's his first yeah. action. And he was pretty much, like, right down the middle. And by right down the middle, I mean, like, 50%. 50% completions, 50% of the right decisions. Like, he was okay. He was not abjectly terrible. He didn't look lost. And he didn't really sort of elevate anybody which is a lot to ask for in a rookie's first preseason game still one of the more experienced throwers in this class he needs more reps still he's not as experienced as Kenny Pickett he's way more experienced than somebody like Trey Lance was coming out um I think he's likely to start a decent number of games this year everybody talked about his maturity as a player as a person um I there's no serious investment um from a from a team standpoint in Marcus Mariota in terms of Marcus wasn't brought in to be the savior he's not being paid that way can he start games and be effective I think he can I'm still a Mariota believer but does that keep you in any way from wanting to play Ritter and see what you have there not really there's not that kind of financial or presumptive starter bias that's going to keep that from happening so I think we're going to get to see Ritter. He's going to have a rookie season, a rookie quarterback season. We've talked about how difficult those are. We're going to see the ups and downs. We're going to see decisions he should have made. He's going to be learning in front of our eyes. Our expectations aren't super high, nor are they super low. I think he'll be pretty good. His surrounding cast has gotten better. Uh, maybe not better from Cincinnati. Well, no, definitely better from Cincinnati. He has more uh, the Falcons have gone out and drafted targets. The fact for the that you had years. to like pause for a second, by the way, tells you how talented Cincinnati was. Yeah, last year. <laughs> a lot of guys drafted up that roster, but then I was like, wait, he has yeah. Kyle Pitts, London. Uh, no, he's yeah, he's got more talent. Um, yeah. he, he learns really quickly. He's a very smart guy. Again, that maturity and experience. I think we could see some semi-rapid improvement again near the end of the year. We might start to see that curve, assuming he's starting go up pretty rapidly in the games that might just be lost games for Atlanta fans. But if anybody's really interested in rookie development, watch those last two or three games from Ritter. You might see a bit of a sort of mini sophomore jump right at the end of the year as, as everything starts to gel for him because he does learn very quickly. Right now, we're just going to call that grade incomplete. He's where he should be. He's learning. He's on the path. 
we'll see how well he does that throughout the season and then go from there. I mean, my thoughts on Ritter are very similar to Malik Willis in the sense that he ended up in the exact right position, which is somewhere he doesn't have to start. I do think that if Ritter had to start this year, he absolutely could, and I think he would be uh, more effective than Malik Willis would be right now. But the fact that he doesn't have to play right now and he can learn the offense and learn all of the new language because absolutely this offense uh, under Arthur Smith has a, a different verbiage system than what he's used to at Cincinnati. They run very different systems. There's a lot of similar concepts, but they call it different stuff. You know, the site adjust for each route are different. How things are blocked is different. Protection calls are different. Everything is different. So he still has to learn all that stuff. And quite frankly, without having a whole offseason getting starters reps, it's tough for a rookie to come in and immediately be the guy. Like, other than Justin Herbert, who's the last one that you can remember that you know, wasn't the guy all of his rookie season and then suddenly just got thrown in the game and was a Pro Bowl caliber quarterback. It's very rare. So he is the number two. He should be the number two for as long as humanly possible. Let him learn the game. Let him learn the system. Let him learn the verbiage. Let him learn how to call things at the line because it's an entirely different thing that he's trying to download right now. And then once he actually is ready and can get on the field, Lucky for him, he has a whole bunch of six four receivers that worst case scenario, it's at fuck it, Drake's down there somewhere. You know, like that's he has the luxury of being able to do that. But luckily he doesn't have to right now. So let him sit, let him learn. He's in a great position to do that. God willing, Marcus will stay healthy, which I know is not normally what he does, but God willing he stays healthy. And best case scenario, if Raider doesn't even have to step on the field till like the last quarter of the season when he's ready. That's what we're hoping for. But for now, the longer he's on the bench, the better. Yeah, I would agree. I know that Atlanta fans are going to want to see him. The new thing, look, the backup quarterback is always the most popular guy in town uh, because it's, yeah. you know, hope unbridled, right? We don't know yet. Uh, we know about this guy. We don't know about that guy. So it could be anything. Could be a boat behind door number two, right? We'll find out. There'll be chances for that in Atlanta, but. The one notable other, as we talk about these 10 quarterbacks now, 11, is Davis Mills. And, and being a Houston guy, I'm going to let you take that one. Um, one of the best stories in the league last year from a development standpoint. Davis Mills, um, you know, when you and I were, were watching him when he was coming out, and I remember particularly the UCLA game, and there were some massive highs and there were some Ugh, ugly lows and we both said if you could just bottle the highs and have that be a quarterback prospect he's he's a first round pick and remember he was a five-star kid coming out like he was highly mm -hmm. recruited very talented great arm strength but there were some lows in there as well that you you didn't trust it he was a day two prospect for a reason because there would be for lack of a better word, uh, you know, Texans fans from from back in the heyday will remember Matt Schaub had a tendency for for what the fuck throws. He had at least one a game. Well, Davis Mills at Stanford had two or three a game where you're like, where's that to Davis? Who's that going to? <laughs> you know, and that's better now. He's not just winging it blind at some points like he did with Stanford, where he's just it's not even like throwing to a window. He would just throw up prayers. And they would either get picked or, you know, f sail wildly incomplete. And we had no explanation for it. He doesn't do that as much now. It's all of the good stuff, you know, the in command, on time, in rhythm, being able to rip balls outside the numbers at 15 to 20 yard depths where you're like, oh my God, this looks like a first round pick. And it's so funny. I, I was, um, God, I think I was, when I was studying, I can't remember what Pac-12 uh, defensive player it was. But I thought that I was looking at a, a 2021 game against Stanford. I was actually looking at a 2020. And the Stanford quarterback was just dropping dimes deep down the field. And I'm like, who the hell is that? Why have I not heard anything about that kid coming out next year? And then it took me about two drives where I was like, wait a minute, I know that number. No, that. Oh, I'm in the wrong year. That's Davis Mills. Oh, my God. I forgot Davis Mills was doing that at Stanford. And it was a great reminder of like, yeah, there was a lot of good on tape, but there was also so much bad. And now we're just getting the good. 
And so he was one of the best rookie quarterbacks last year because not just he was exceeding the good he did in college, he was matching the good in college. He just got rid of a lot of the bad shit, a lot of the erratic throws, a lot of the completely inexplicable decisions. He just bottled the good, which is what we hoped from him. And I don't know how. I have no idea how it happened, how, you know, from a five-month period going from Stanford to the NFL, he suddenly got rid of all the, the terrible habits we hated. But for the most part, he did. And so Houston definitely has something there. I would say, just like the others, there's a 60 to 70 percent chance he's working out. And just based on last year, I would lean more towards the 70 percent than the 60 percent. Because if he just maintains what he did last year and builds on it, he's a franchise quarterback that they got on day two, by the way, which is incredible and also super rare. Yeah, if you're wondering what that is and you're not, it's Pep Hamilton, right? Pep Hamilton in his ear. True. Yes. Saying, keep this shed that and and i'll give you a musical analogy gary clark jr is a blues player that came out of texas love him and yeah yeah many people including me love gary clark jr to death but uh, other musicians and and some early reviewers of his work in texas were amazed that as a young player that started playing out they said he he never hits the wrong note like he's just never where he shouldn't be and they asked him about that and he said, look, I've been sitting in my room for the last six years hitting wrong notes. I got them all out of my system, <laughs> right? I, I just, like, I already hit them all. You just didn't get to hear them. I did them back there. And I feel that's, like, a little bit like Mills and Stanford going, yeah, I got those dumb shit plays out of my system. And Stanford, you can go see a lot of them. Pep's making sure that I don't do that as much anymore. And what we're getting is that version that we wanted, the version we always want of a quarterback like that, optimize, or of any player for that matter, the optimized man, if he could just do that more often, we'd have something. And he's doing that more often, and the Texans absolutely have something. There's a lot of intriguing young quarterbacks in the league right now, EJ, a lot of them. And we know statistically most of them aren't going to work out. In fact, like 30% of first-round quarterbacks work out. And that's just guys in the first round. Their percentage goes down (laughs) with each passing round. So most of the guys we talked about today are not going to be long-term starters in the league, even the ones we like. You know, all these guys that were giving, you know, 60 to 70% chances of working, that doesn't mean that 60 60 to 70% of them are going to work. We're talking individually 60 to 70% chance of them working. So again, realistically, probably about 30% of them are going to be good. As for which ones are going to be good, which ones are actually going to be the ones that hit, fuck if I know. I was going to say, if we knew that, (laughs) we wouldn't be in these chairs. We'd be sitting in that uh, Cliff Kingsbury house with that view, having already bet on that. Um, Yeah, I don't think anybody knows that, but the progress is extremely fun to watch. We want to talk about the positives. Many of you that are here and following along are here because of that, because we're saying what could be, what are we hopeful about, um, with a dose of reality as well. But, you know, make no mistake, we want to see those positives. We want to see those players ascend. Are they all going to ascend? Hell no. Like, that is not the reality in, in the given NFL. Are some of them going to? Yeah. Is it going to be super fun to watch? Hell yeah. Honestly, all I hope for is that at least some of the guys that work out are the ones that are in traditionally terrible franchises. Because I love when a team like Jacksonville, you know, raises itself out of the mud and and completely flips the script. Like the Chiefs, not long ago, by the way, the Chiefs were that team. Like they were awful. They had the first round pick, uh, first overall pick, I should say, 10 years ago. And they had it in like one of the the, the worst years to have it because it was like, you know, the top two players in the draft were Luke Jokel and Eric Fisher, you know, and then next year it was like Aaron Donald and Khalil Mack and Odell and Sammy Walker, you know, all these, Devontae was in that year, like all these great players. And then in the year before their first round pick 2012 was like the Andrew Luck year. So like they had like the worst possible year to have a first overall pick. And now look at them, you know, like teams are able to rise out of bad histories and become something Lord willing Trevor Lawrence is going to be one of them. I know I want Justin Fields to be one of them because the Bears sure need it. And I just, I, I don't know. I wish for success for fan bases that that are desperate for it because I think those are always the best stories in the NFL is when, is when suffering fan bases get a little bit of hope, just a little bit of hope. That's all I want. 
And quarterbacks help with that. Quarterbacks are the thing to bring hope to a franchise. So we'll see which ones, uh, you know, rise and fall. And again, progression is not linear. We could see really good seasons from some of these guys and then have them fall off or vice versa. They might take a little bit longer to develop. So I hope some franchises have a little bit of patience. But again, it's kind of like Justin Fields. You got to pick the right moment for patience and the right moment to be decisive and say, nope, we're moving on. We, we got to get something else because we just don't have an answer at quarterback. Before we get out of here in terms of what's next, uh, remember, regular season podcasts are starting up pretty soon here. We have this episode dropping, then we got two more dropping before games begin. You know, we'll do our season awards predictions. Um, we'll take a look at like winners and losers of the preseason so far. So we have plenty coming out uh, pretty soon here. In fact, we're recording half of those today. So uh, lots to come on the channel. And then, of course, we're going to have episodes every single week during the regular season and playoffs. And we have big, big massive news to share that we can almost share but not quite yet but it will be coming soon i promise trust me you'll notice so uh that's all coming up i want to thank our executive producers andrew marat consti and connor you guys are warriors we love you guys uh, remember to check out the patreon if you want to you know support the show and help us keep doing this for a living we love all you guys and uh until next week later take care